everybody. It's um, great to be here today. Um, we've had a good couple of days down here in Greymouth, meeting people and having a look around. We spent Friday night at the shed and got to have some fun there and try out the new mini golf course. I think the boys enjoyed that. So it's um, yeah, it's, it's been good. So Habakkuk. How many people have read Habakkuk? Not for a while. Not for a while. No, it's one of those books that sort of. Who actually knew Habakkuk existed before today? <laughs> it's one of those books that sort of become obscured in the Old Testament somewhere. You might sort of see the title when you open up the um, title of the contents page at the front of your Bible, and that's about as far as it gets. But it's, it's got a message that I think is, is quite, quite um, worth listening to. So I'm going to talk about the book of Habakkuk today. I want to start off by asking some questions. How often do we find God not living up to our expectations? Are we expecting God to work in a particular way? Do we want obvious and clear direction to a certain life question? Are we anticipating that he will take care of it, whatever it may be for us at this particular moment? Where is God when we need him? We can certainly expect a lot from God. But where are we left when our expectations are not met? I first became aware of God calling me to ministry when I was 16. The people around me were confirming it. I had people in our youth group at the time who would come to me to talk they would even call me at times Pastor Joe. After a short term mission trip to India following high school, I returned home not sure of what the next step would be. A few weeks of sitting at home wondering, and I received a phone call from Richard, Bishop Richard, who was at the time the Vicar of Nativity in Blenheim. I was asked to take over running the youth ministry. This was my big chance. God was opening up my path to ministry. I was excited. My hopes and plans, my dreams were coming to something. I was going to be super youth pastor Joe, empowered by God with super spiritual gifts. I would grow the youth group double, triple, even quadruple the size. I would preach to young people and they would be saved. I would counsel them and all their problems would be solved. Let's just say that super youth pastor Joe wasn't so super. And I'm sure I wondered many times why God wasn't living up to my expectations. Why wouldn't he make me super? Wasn't God meant to be on my side? By the end of the year I had realised how much I did not know. And when the job finished, I went to Bible college, hoping to learn something. Maybe something there would make me super. As we look at the message of Habakkuk, we find that we are not alone in questioning God's actions or seemed inaction at times. As we look at the world around us, as we look at times in our own lives, we can wonder where is God? Like Habakkuk, we can be frustrated. Like Habakkuk, we can cry out, why? And like Habakkuk, we can wonder, where is God? Habakkuk brings his prophecy to the people of Judah at a time in their history when things are looking rather dark. Rather depressing, we could say. Israel, the northern kingdom, had already been invaded and defeated. They were being ruled by foreign people. Habakkuk delivers his message over a number of years, in which Judah was a vassal state. Yes, they had their own king, but they were paying a tribute to other kingdoms for their safety. First to Assyria, and then to Egypt. 
And in later years, the Babylonian Empire hovered upon Judah's border like a cat playing with a mouse. Twice Babylon invaded before the final prophesied destruction of Jerusalem. Spiritually, Judah had fallen far from their following of God. Idol worship had once again emerged. Corrupt rulers and officials abounded. And the people were far from the Lord that God had given them. They had wandered far from his ways. We read in 2 Kings chapter 24 that the authors had no doubt that behind the political turmoil of the time was the hand of God judging Judah for its sins and especially those of the previous ruler, Manasseh. We read in 2 Kings 24, Surely these things happened in Judah according to the Lord's command in order to remove from his presence because of the sins of Manasseh and all that he had done. You see, Manasseh, among other things, had encouraged the idolatry. This is the king encouraging idols within the temple that was built to God. He even encouraged human sacrifice, including his own son. This sort of spiritual decline had resulted in moral decay. The people were moving far from God. Crime and violence were commonplace. The doings of the evil and the wicked succeeded, while the poor were oppressed. Judah was fast sinking into a dark hole of spiritual and moral corruption. And the righteous, those who still worship the true God, watched and waited for God to work. They waited. And on their behalf, Habakkuk cries out, cries out to God. And this is what we get in the book of Habakkuk. Habakkuk crying out on behalf of the people. Where are you? And so we have this dialogue that takes place. Habakkuk crying out and then God responding. And it goes backwards and forwards a couple of times. Habakkuk begins with the question, why? Why does God not act against the evil? He wants to know why God allows wicked people to prosper and justice to be perverted. Listen to his complaint. How long, Lord, must I call for help? but you do not listen or cry out to you violence but you do not save why do you make me look at injustice why do you tolerate wrongdoing surely the Lord is meant to look after his people surely the Lord is meant to be on the side of the righteous How long must they endure before God finally does something about their suffering? Habakkuk was perplexed that wickedness, strife and oppression were rampant in Judah. But God seemingly does nothing. The Lord responds to Habakkuk's question. Watch and be utterly amazed. I am raising up the Babylonians, a feared and dreaded people. The Babylonians would bring the coming judgment on Judah. God was acting, only it was not in a way that was expected. In fact, it was unbelievable. How could God use the Babylonian Empire to come with their armies and bring judgment? How could a righteous God use such an unrighteous and ungodly people as his tool to bring judgment. Amidst the gloom that already surrounds Judah, it seems that God is adding further darkness with their imminent destruction. This response was not very encouraging for Habakkuk. He struggles to grasp 
how God is going to act through this. Isn't God meant to be on our side? And he's struggling to bring together what he knows about God and what God is speaking to him. It just doesn't fit together for him. And so he goes back to God asking, how does this work? And so God responds again in chapter 2 and makes it clear that although judgment is coming from Babylon, Babylon itself would also be destroyed. God would have its retribution. And further, God goes on to say that the righteous are to live by faith. There is recognition that God is in control. He has a plan that is unfolding. Whether we understand this plan or not is unimportant. It is vital, however, that we continue to have faith in God, to trust in his plan of redemption and deliverance. And in response, Habakkuk finishes with a prayer that we find in chapter 3, focusing on God's faithfulness, his faithfulness in the past, and he does this by remembering what God has done. Just as in the past, God will continue to be faithful. This confidence in God produces one of the most moving expressions of faith and trust in the whole Bible. Listen to Habakkuk's response that comes despite everything that is happening. Though the fig tree does not bud, and there are no grapes on the vines, though the olive crop fails and produces no food, though there are no sheep in the pen or cattle in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God my Saviour. Despite the suffering, despite everything being stripped away, Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God, my Saviour. We find in this book of Habakkuk that it is okay to question God. It's okay to struggle and doubt. To ask questions. Where are you, God? What are you doing? Habakkuk takes his doubts and complaints to God. He lays them out for him. He wanted to understand what God was doing. Why did he allow injustice to prevail? Why did he allow the poor to be oppressed? Such wickedness and destruction. He questions God because so much does not make sense to him. When I was 11 years old, I remember crying out to God after my parents were in a car accident. It was unknown if Dad was going to live. I cried out to God, why have you let this happen to my Christian family? Where were you, God? Wasn't God meant to be on our side? And so I struggled with my limited understanding of who God was as a child to work out where he was in the midst of all this and there may not be a truly satisfactory answer to much of what happens in our fallen world and God's ways God may not always answer the questions that we have with the answers that we are hoping for or the clarity that we want Yet looking back years later, I was able to see God at work in our family, bringing about a vibrancy of faith, of dependence on him, as we grew over those years to trust in God, regardless of the pain and the suffering that we endured. Yes, crap happened. But God was faithful through it. Never letting go. We are allowed to yell and to scream at God. 
and I have done so. We are allowed to confront him with our confusion and our complaints. And I've done that. When life sucks, when God seems hidden, if he doesn't answer or act as we expect, tell him how you feel. Be honest. Be honest with God. Jump up and down. Have a wobbly. We're allowed to. It's being honest with God. But don't lose faith because he will never let you go. He is faithful to us. And it's this faithfulness that we see occurring in God's plans for Judah. Yes, he's bringing judgment. But we need to understand the judgment that is taking place. It's a gracious judgment. God is acting in love. He's bringing his people who have moved so far from God and his ways. He's bringing them to a place that they need to turn back to him. To rely on him. To find the God that they had trusted in. And so God's judgment is out of love. He is faithful to his people. He doesn't let them go. And to provide an anchor for this faith, we see Habakkuk turn to the past works of God. He looks to God's faithfulness throughout the journey of God's people. Where has God been faithful? He looks to Abraham and Isaac. He looks to the bringing of the people out of Egypt, through the desert, and God's faithfulness and provision through all those times. He looks to how God has been with the armies of Judah and the nation in defeating the enemies at times. God has been faithful, and God doesn't change. God has been faithful in the past. He will continue to be faithful in the future. He cries out, I have heard of your fame. I stand in awe of your deeds, O Lord. Renew them in our day. Continue to be faithful. God's faithfulness is abundant throughout Scripture and it culminates in the sacrifice and redemptive work on, of Jesus on the cross. And it continues to be evidenced in the life of the church. In our lives, we see God's faithfulness at work. And as we share our testimonies, as we share about what God is doing in our lives, it not only encourages ourselves and brings back to mind what God is doing, but it shares that encouragement and that faithfulness that God has been with the rest of those around us. We need to be open about what God is doing in our lives to encourage each other. And that was great to hear those testimonies at the start, to, to hear what God is doing. Because he is faithful. He is with us. Maybe we should take a moment now just to think. When has God been faithful to you? When has God helped you? Answered a prayer or given guidance? Sometimes it can be hard to see God at work in our lives. But we need to remember that he is faithful. He is at work. And as we remember the times in the past that he's been faithful, we know that God is unchanging. And no matter how dark the present may be, we know that he is faithful. He's walking with us, step by step. step by step in the walk that we walk through our life. Hopefully we can begin to see that the book of Habakkuk has a message for us. Maybe hiding somewhere in the Old Testament. But this is God's word. It is relevant to us. 
Habakkuk's provided some insight into some of the questions that can plague us in life. Yes, Habakkuk is talking about injustice and sin and evil. But he's also talking about suffering and pain and struggling with where God is through all of this. Asking about where God is when he seems to be absent. We learn that God's ways can be different from our ways. And rather than God changing his actions to meet our expectations or understanding, we are challenged instead to trust in God, knowing that he is faithful. Bad stuff happens. We live through difficult times. But in Habakkuk we see a God who has proven faithful and will continue to be faithful. God is on our side. Admit, admit, Amidst the darkness, there is a message of God's faithfulness that remains bright and constant, even in the darkest parts of our lives. Let's remember God's faithfulness. Let's pray. Lord, you are a faithful God. Help us to remember that when things get dark, when you seem distant. You are the Lord God who walks with us. Help us to remember you. Help us to trust in you. Help us to turn to you, being honest. And in you, Lord, we trust, knowing that you will never let us go. You will never let us go. Amen. Mm-hmm.